Thank you very much, Tony. And uh, let me say thanks to the Institute for inviting me to speak on the Western Balkans and the EU's transformative power. It's an honor to be here, to be addressing this uh, meeting, to be in the company of so many experts, uh, officials, um, academics, and others who, whose knowledge of the region is probably much greater than mine. But nonetheless, I will uh, volunteer to put forward a few ideas, a few tentative questions, and um, a presentation that will open up the space for discussion, debate, argument, and perhaps agreement, too, on a number of issues. I'm very pleased also to be here now, rather than when the invitation was initially issued uh, back in the early spring, uh, not only because the weather is now much better, and uh, a nicer time. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> True, but I, I think the forecast for tomorrow is, is, very, is nice. Uh, but also because um, perhaps the outlook for the Balkans, the Western Balkans, is also somewhat sunnier now than it would have been two, three, four months ago. Indeed, I think one could argue that the last four weeks, the last mm -hmm. month, has produced more good news, or the Western Balkans produced more good news than perhaps the previous two to three years. And, and as we speak, um, to give just but, but one example, um, the European Council is deciding on confirming, we expect, the recommendation of the Commission, uh, which was made about two weeks ago, that Croatia's accession talks should now be completed, with a view to Croatia becoming a member in two years' time, in July 2013. Perhaps some of you may even up update me and say that the decision has been... No, exactly. As we Oh, that's, that's nice to be up to date in that case. Uh, so that's, that's definitely good news. Um, more unexpected, and in some ways, for that reason, perhaps even more positive news, came a month ago at the end of May when um, General Ratko Mladic, the wartime commander, military commander of the Bosnian Serb forces, was arrested in Serbia and was speedily transferred to the International Tribunal in The Hague for trial on account of genocide, war crimes, uh, crimes against humanity, having been on the run for 16 years. Um, and in a sense, this removed perhaps the, the major block from in the path of Serbia gaining um, the status of an EU candidate. Um, elsewhere, uh, Montenegro, again, recent news reports suggest over the last couple of days that Montenegro may soon be in line for uh, getting a start date for its accession talks. Certainly the Hungarian presidency has been going out of its way to help the Western Balkan countries, and Montenegro seems next in line for positive news. Um, and, and, and even in Bosnia, which in some ways has been seen as the kind of black hole in the region, um, a few weeks ago in early June, the names of three candidates were put forward for the post of Prime Minister in the central government, perhaps uh, marking the first step towards um, ending the paralysis, the political paralysis, the government crisis that has been ongoing since October, since the October elections. Um, and now the formation of the government may be in sight in the next few weeks or perhaps another few months. So progress on, on all these issues is very welcome. Uh, some of it expected, uh, some of it coming on schedule, some of it unexpected, and, 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 but nonetheless uh, very positive indeed. But having said all that, all, and, and to some extent these recent events have partially lifted the gloom that descended on the Western Balkans in recent years in terms of, its, of the region's EU uh, accession and integration process. But I think before we start to celebrate, I think it's probably as well to remind ourselves of the many problems facing the region in its attempts to find its way to Europe, and in more general terms also, to introduce the reforms that are so much needed uh, to do with the, the, the litany of ills that have beset the region, corruption, uh, poor standards of governance, um, many cases a democratic deficit, and indeed uh, even an absence of the rule of law. Um, and what I would suggest to do in our next 20, 25 minutes is to, to look at some of the, uh, the, the, the examples of the, uh, of the backsliding uh, in terms of performance in the region, the kind of democratic deficit, 
then to move on and suggest some of the reasons for the, the slowdown, the lack of progress, and then end the discussion, or rather the presentation, and opening up the, the session for discussion, just to look at um, what could be done, perhaps, to, uh, to build on these, these most recent successes in a positive way and to consolidate them. Um, so, to come back to the, the achievements that we, uh, I mentioned early on, and then to qualify them now, and to some extent try to take some of the um, shine off them, uh, not in a negative way, but simply to put them in context. I think it's important to note, for example, that uh, Croatia's accession talks, which are now drawing to a close, and will lead to the country in all, almost all certainty, but uh, very likely to join the um, EU in two years' time, that these talks have, of course, taken um, almost six years, a um, rather long period, and at some stage it was expected that Croatia might have been able to have completed them a year, 18 months, even two years earlier, but for the fact that, of course, it had a dispute, a bilateral dispute with Slovenia over uh, territorial waters and, uh, and the land border, and this uh, dispute led to the talks uh, being blocked by Slovenia for the best part of 2009. And that contributed to the, the fact that this process has taken longer than perhaps it should have taken. So um, I think that that is one important element to bear in mind in terms of the, um, the slowdown in um, in the integration process and the, the apparent waning of the EU's transformative powers, which, um, which I've referred to. I think secondly, uh, again, if we're looking at timetables and timeframes, however positive the news about General Mladic's arrest and uh, transfer to the tribunal in The Hague, the fact it is that it took 16 years from the time when he was initially indicted and of course, even casting aside the understandable reasons for many years when he was enjoying the hospitality of General, uh, of President Milosevic in Serbia. But if you look at the fact that in the last few years, certainly uh, President Tadic has been in power for the last um, seven years now, a government that's sympathetic to his pro-European um, um, position has been in power for three years, and yet it, it is taken a, a long time to finally apprehend the general. And I don't think one needs to be necessarily a conspiracy theorist to argue that maybe there was an element of uh, politicking behind all this, that maybe, just maybe, um, uh, the reason it's, it's happened is that, uh, at least partly, why the timing of the uh, apprehension of the general is partly to do with Serbia's need to come up to produce some result in, the, uh, in terms of what is expected of it from the EU to speed up its, uh, the process of it, of it becoming a candidate for membership. Um, as, for, um, uh, as for Bosnia, um, I think it would be naive to expect that uh, even if a government is formed in the next uh, couple of months perhaps, it may take a bit longer, even if a government is formed, that it would in a sense bring to an end the many unresolved issues, the outstanding problems uh, that um, paralyzed governance and indeed reform, not just since the elections of October last year, but indeed um, in the period le leading up to it. And I think it would be probably uh, fair to say that the, the kind of process of the, the slowdown in reforms, the, the, the backsliding, um, in, in a sense, in the region, to the extent that it's a regional phenomenon, I think it began in, in Bosnia, and indeed not, not in the last few months, but uh, we can go back five years to the failure of the, pre of the constitutional reforms uh, that were agreed uh, in Washington at the end of 2005, the failure of those reforms um, to be implemented indeed or to be enacted in parliament uh, as several parties reneged on their promises back in 2006 in the run-up to the previous elections. And since then, Bosnia has really been marking time. Bosnia has been uh, failing to, to come up with the reforms, the integration of the, the two entities, the strengthening of some central government institutions and constitutional reforms that are required for it to be able to, uh, to move along the path to European integration. So, um, and these are just some, the three of the 
achievements I've tried to qualify, but there are also, I think, problems further afield. I think Albania is a very obvious example of a country where polarization between the government uh, the, uh, and, and the opposition has um, taken the country back to perhaps its worst political crisis since the mid-1990s to 1997 in particular, um, uh, the uprising at the time against the regime. What we've seen in Albania in the last two years, since June 2009, since the parliamentary elections, is a refusal by the opposition to accept the results, arguing that uh, there was uh, ballot rigging in some cases, a refusal of the governing parties to, to, to mount a proper inquiry, a parliamentary inquiry, and indeed uh, any hope that, um, that these matters would be laid to rest or at the very least some kind of um, compromise solution might emerge in the, wake of, uh, in the wake of the recent local authority elections in early May, any hope that those elections, if conducted fairly in a way acceptable to, to all sides, would then lead, in a sense, the to a process whereby the ongoing dispute over the previous elections, the parliamentary elections two years ago, would, 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 would be, uh, that, 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 that this would, could be bypassed in some way. Well, that has sadly now been, um, uh, that, that opportunity has now gone. If anything, the situation has become more polarized. The, uh, there is an ongoing dispute over the election, election of the mayor of Tirana, which is the, um, in fact, that post is the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the main prize to, to be won. And the, um, the dispute resolves over a whole number of issues relating to invalid ballot papers, ballot papers that were put in the wrong ballot boxes. And uh, suffice to say that there have been several recounts, and the latest version from the uh, latest ruling from the Electoral College, the supreme electoral body in the country, is that the government's candidate, uh, Mr. Basha, won by about 91 votes, uh, but the opposition continues to dispute that. And um, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's leading to a situation where uh, there is little prospect of uh, agreement. And of course, um, we've seen that at the end of last year, even before these latest uh, controversies over the local election results, we've seen that at the end of last year, the EU um, decided not to grant Albania candidate status precisely because of the absence of a constructive political dialogue between the government, the centre-right government, and the socialist opposition. And since then, things have only got worse with violence in January and then the local elections in May. Looking elsewhere, and um, sort of about to, I think, um, round off this, uh, this litany of, of problems and ills, uh, Macedonia has had trouble for elections um, uh, a few weeks ago. Um, uh, the government, uh, of course, got <coughs> elected. Uh, but, of course, the country's Euro-Atlantic integration has remained hostage to uh, its dispute uh, with Greece over Macedonia's official name. And that RA has been keeping Macedonia in the waiting room uh, for EU accession ever since the end of 2005. And it's also barred the country from um, joining NATO in 2009. There are no signs of an early settlement to the dispute. And if anything, Greece has been angered by the Macedonian authorities' uh, ongoing redevelopment of Skopje city centre, which stresses the connections between uh, present-day Macedonia and the Macedonia or Macedonian region of ancient history. And in the process of doing that, it's been expropriating what Greeks regard as their own, uh, as their own history. So um, it's, it's, it remains... Um, uh, to put it mildly, a, a tricky problem, and indeed it could even be ex exacerbated by a ruling from the ICJ um, uh, expected later this year. The International Court of Justice is expected to rule on Macedonia's uh, claim that Greece uh, in effect breached its legal obligations by refusing to allow Macedonia to join NATO back in 2009 under Macedonia's internationally accepted internationally used name of the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. Um, having said that Macedonia was the, the, the final problem I was going to highlight before moving on to the reasons uh, that have uh, affected the 
this waning of the EU's transformative powers. I think it is also just worth mentioning, and perhaps not just in passing, but uh, Kosovo, uh, in a sense, not quite in the same category as the other, other states. It is not a fully recognized state. It has got no seat at the UN three years after, more than three years after its declaration of independence. It is not recognized by five of the EU's member states, and also it is not recognized by three um, Balkan states, two in the Western Balkans, obviously, uh, Serbia, of course, and, and Bosnia, and also uh, Romania. Um, and of course, in fact, I should also add Greece um, um, in, in the region of countries that have not recognized it. And even apart from these issues concerning its statehood, its, um, uh, um, its status as a, as a state, uh, there have been very serious problems in terms of a democratic deficit or in terms of the rule of law being violated, most importantly in the highest uh, public position, the, that of the head of state, where we had a succession of very serious breaches of uh, constitutional um, uh, regulations. For example, the, um, the um, uh, successor to the, the, the country's founding father, to Ibrahim Rugova, the, the president who succeeded him, uh, Fatih Seydou, combined the posts of head of state, which is a politically neutral position, with being leader of the um, Democratic League of Kosovo, and did so for uh, up until the late last year, for over uh, for several years, in, in violation of the constitution, which bars the com uh, combining the, uh, a political post with uh, being head of state. And then, of course, the election of, of his successor, Mr. Pazzoli, uh, back in February, Bejet Pazzoli, uh, took place again in conditions that were then deemed by the Constitutional Court to be unconstitutional because uh, Parliament lacked a quorum at the time when it was elected. So a whole number of uh, very blatant breaches of constitutional um, regulations which could have been and ought to have been avoided and uh, at the very least they reflect badly on the way the political elite in Kosovo have been um, running the country um, on a more positive note, I think it's worth mentioning very briefly that talks have started between Kosovo and Serbia back in March on a number of technical issues uh, relating to customs, transport, and, and so on. And although no, although little headway has been made so far, at the very least, the talks are ongoing. Um, having said all that, and um, I would now like to turn to the, the reasons behind why the uh, transformative power of the EU has, has weakened. And indeed, um, having said it right at the very beginning of my uh, presentation, that I'm glad I'm talking now in a slightly more positive environment than would have been the case perhaps three months ago, when I think my question mark, or there would have been several question marks after, <laughs> as to what happened to the transformative power of the EU, I think now we can... Um, put that in a slightly more uh, positive light or a more um, balanced way. And uh, we don't need to be as negative. So I think we can take away a couple of the question marks and just leave one there. But to, to turn to the, uh, the reasons, I think, the, to my mind, the most obvious one, uh, why is the EU not seen or perceived in the region as, as, as being the kind of magnet um, uh, that uh, it certainly was for many Central European countries that joined in 2004 and then in 2007, and it certainly was also for the countries of the Western Balkans. I think we need to go back several years. It's not a new uh, development, but one aspect of it, one important aspect, is, which goes back, in effect, a decade, is the fact that um, the EU's attention has moved away from the Western Balkans. It is difficult now to recall, other than for those of us who've been dealing with the region for a rather a long time, and that includes probably several of us, but it's difficult to recall how important the region was, of course, in the 1990s, and right going back to the beginning of 19, the 1990s, and the attempt to forge a common European uh, foreign security defense uh, policy, uh, Yugoslavia was in effect, the, the breakup of the former Yugoslavia was seen as a, a kind of milestone in, sadly at the time, in the failure of the EU to come up with, and the EC uh, um, to come up with, with a, a kind of coordinated policy. And then later on in the 1990s, and thanks 
of course, to, uh, in some ways to you, a very strong American uh, involvement, both in Bosnia in 1995 and then over Kosovo in 1999, and not in just in the military but diplomatic sense, of course, uh, things began to move on. But certainly in the 1990s and right up to and, and in the aftermath of the Kosovo conflict and, of course, the Zagreb summit in, in the year 2000, which, which, which kind of, in effect, gave a European prospect for the countries of the Western Balkan region. And then three years later, in Thessaloniki, which formally confirmed this uh, uh, prospect of eventual membership um, for the EU, the Western Balkans was a, a key priority. Now, of course, or not, now, not just now, but over the last 10 years, in the aftermath of 9-11, concern about Islamic extremism, what used to be called the war on terror, Iraq, Afghanistan, the detention has, has moved elsewhere. Uh, some of these issues remain as problematic today as they were a decade ago, and of course new ones have soon joined them. Most recently the uh, arrival of the Arab Spring, uh, the uh, prospect of some democratic uh, progress in that region on the southern periphery of the um, EU, and also, sadly, and more dangerously, uh, the prospect or indeed the already occurrence of a slide from peaceful protest to repression, armed conflict, civil war in the case of Libya and Syria. Second point I would like to, to, to mention is the um, EU's concentration on its own internal problems, in, especially in the wake of the global financial crisis and recession, and the subsequent sovereign debt crises, particularly in Greece, but also, of course, Ireland and Portugal, which have required so much of these attention over the last 18 months, uh, the, the, the battle to avoid a sovereign default um, and to save the euro has consumed much of the EU's resources in terms of time, uh, financing, and, of course, the policymakers' energy, too, um, coming on top of the enlargement fatigue that was already perceptible in, in, in a number of um, EU members in recent years. The focus on the sovereign debt crisis has distracted more of the um, attention that was already waning in any case away from the Western Balkans. The impact of this has been particularly damaging in the case of Greece. Um, one of the leading champions of the EU's <coughs> enlargement uh, in the Western Balkans um, notwithstanding, of course, its reservations about Macedonia. Uh, Greece, even a couple of years ago, was talking, uh, Greek politicians, leaders talking um, somewhat unrealistically, perhaps, about uh, a fresh round of accession or coming something close to that as soon as 2014 in what would have been a kind of fitting way to mark the centenary of the outbreak of World War I, and of course uh, the, the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand in, in the heart of the, the Balkans in Sarajevo. And it's like, it's a fitting way to, to show reconciliation, <coughs> peace, progress, um, a century after the outbreak of that uh, mass slaughter. Um, moving on, um, another reason I think for the worsening symptoms of enlargement fatigue um, has stemmed from uh, the failure of the most recent EU entrants, Bulgaria and Romania, to implement in full the reforms required uh, in terms of improving the work of the judiciary, combating organized crime and corruption, um, um, to have failed to come up to the the conditionality, um, uh, notwithstanding the, the unprecedented monitoring processes that were put in place following that accession in 2007. Um, I think that the shortcomings of Bulgaria and Romania have prompted um, the EU about to, to, uh, to, to reassess uh, politicians in EU countries to reassess the, the speed and uh, and uh, of, of, of enlargement, and uh, at the same time, the failings of these two new EU members have in some ways had an adverse impact also by suggesting, even encouraging, some of the aspiring EU members in the Western Balkans and their political elites that perhaps they need not work as hard on meeting the EU's benchmarks as they had previously thought that if to put it in plain terms, simplistic terms, if Bulgaria and Romania could get away with it, why not us? Um, moving on from that, uh, and I think uh, it's worth perhaps looking at it from that perspective now, from the region's perspective, uh, that 
along with accession fatigue in the EU, there's also been what some have now called, some observers have called, um, accession uh, fatigue in the, the would-be members. So enlargement fatigue in the EU, accession fatigue, meaning in effect that the political elites in the Western Balkan countries um, have in some ways become more reluctant perhaps to introduce unpopular reforms, particularly when uh, these are painful, have financial cost, and where they're disliked by the public. Um, one reason for the difficulty in selling such reforms um, is the timetable of the EU's integration and the entire EU accession process, uh, which remains a distant goal. It's more difficult when, uh, when, the, when the prize is, 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 is so far away to motivate the population, to um, the public, the electorate, to go along with the reforms. And since that goal is so distant, apart from the case of Croatia, uh, this, this remains, um, remains, I think, a serious problem. Um, I think few would venture to suggest that even at the current rate of progress, and if steady progress were to, were to get underway, that any of the other countries would be able to join much before 2020. That's very far away. Um, but if you look at Croatia's case, it will have taken eight years, almost eight years, if it joins in July 2013, and Croatia was in many ways uh, a much more developed, more integrated country than those further down the line with issues of state building, lack of national identity, um, and, and so on and so forth. Or that in the case of Kosovo, lack of recognition, and so on. Um, I think this, uh, this, this, the reason for this long march to, to membership is, is understandable, because unlike the Central European countries, which joined in 2004, and of course 2007, less successfully mm -hmm. perhaps, these countries now in the queue for EU membership are young, mostly young states, some are newly reconstituted states, and as I've just mentioned, they're still in the process of state building with the, in some cases with the help of the EU, and also they have these disputes over national uh, uh, borders, uh, no settled borders in some cases, uh, also some disputed national identities um, enter into the picture. Moving on from that to the next point I would like to briefly touch on, and I'm, I'm aware that I'm a little bit slow, okay. or uh, maybe a little bit too detailed, but what I will do is I will briefly mention another three points I would like to mention before kind of finishing on, 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 on a few more notes. I think the uh, time frame, uh, and it may seem contradictory, but uh, having mentioned that the time frame is, is too long, is this difficult to motivate both politicians, the elites, and the electorate to introduce the reforms that the EU has been insisting on. It is also very briefly worth mentioning that at the opposite end, when you get some kind of achievement, uh, particularly an important one, that of the uh, lifting of visa requirements for the Western Balkan regions, a process which was completed at the end of last year, apart from Kosovo, that when you have an achievement like that, and then you, you cannot follow it up with another carrot, or a bigger carrot, uh, as it were, but you, you, in a sense, that is also, can be, I think, um, detrimental to progress being made. The reason is that uh, citizens in these countries are, obviously, this is a, a very practical and clear achievement for the, the, so their governments, uh, the specific conditionality for introducing visa free travel has been introduced. The achievement is there, but now there's a kind of, as it were, a kind of vacuum. What next? What can be offered in the next year or two rather than in, in several years or up to 10 years' time? And that is, I think, uh, is also holding back progress um, in the region. Um, and I think I would argue that uh, when Bosnia and Albania finally achieved, belatedly, uh, the status of this uh, visa-free trade to the Schengen countries at the end of last year, a year after their neighbours in the region, that in a sense, with this prize won, since then we've seen further backsliding in both these countries and paralysis and refusal to, to agree on, on reforms or even legislate uh, on uh, reforms. Um, Progress has also been, I think, slowed by the EU's lack of unity in relation to the Western Balkans and several unresolved issues in the region. 
Uh, very, very briefly, Kosovo remains, as I mentioned earlier, unrecognized by five EU members. This in, in, in turn makes it easier for Serbia to put off coming to terms with the loss of what it still regards as its part of its territory, its province. And the, as, as such, it delays progress in settling even the relatively uncontroversial issues on which discussions have been ongoing in, since March. The lack of a unity of purpose in relation to Bosnia is also very clear. The arguments about how to deal with the country, whether to bring to an end the very interventionist uh, international, uh, international presence in the form of the Office of the High Representative, uh, whether Bosnia can be treated in the same way as its neighbors, or on the other hand, should the international community with the EU, of course, in a special, especially important role, continue with a more uh, hands-on approach. That, that, that dilemma remains unresolved, and I think it's also ironic just to remind ourselves that while the EU has been castigating the Bosnian uh, political elite, and rightly so, for failing to uh, elect a uh, former government eight months after the elections of October last year, the EU itself is now, for over a year, hasn't had... Uh, head of mission uh, in Sarajevo since uh, summer of last year. Of course, it's all due to the recalibration of the entire EU presence, the arrival of the new special representative, which is now expected very shortly. But nonetheless, it, uh, it, a, the lack of, uh, a lack of uh, an EU presence in the terms of the head of the mission, I think the allegation has been a, a clearly a, a signal which has been exploited by local politicians uh, and uh, indeed the particularly by, uh, first and foremost, by the uh, Bosnian Serb president, Milorad Dodik, uh, Dodik, and but others too. I think more broadly, um, there's also the issue of, um, and this is now crucial, that uh, I've already referred to the fact that the EU is concentrating very much on its own, putting its own house in order, of course, a clear and uh, immediate task, but that the entire... Con, uh, the entire crisis the, of, the, of the Eurozone, which some would argue is, is the, the worst problem that the European enterprise has faced since, well, since, uh, look at 1957, the Treaty of Rome, or, or indeed uh, go back further, the European coal and steel community, if indeed this is certainly in terms of financial terms, uh, is, is, is a, is a, uh, Europe has reached a crossroads, this is in some ways making um, the EU a less attractive proposition for would-be members. I'm not suggesting for a minute that, uh, that there's an alternative to the Western Balkans, there's somewhere else to turn. I'm not saying that, you know, whether it's Russia or whatever, but uh, it simply is, is not quite, hasn't got the same magnetic force that it has had certainly beyond, before the, um, the global recession, uh, and of course more particularly the, debt, the sovereign debt crisis that, uh, and, and, and Greece's um, uh, role that in particular. And a final point, uh, having mentioned the global recession, the global downturn, and I don't, I, I really can uh, just abbreviate what I was going to say, but I think that the, 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 the point I was going to make there, why is it that the EU is seen as, as as, as less powerful in terms of attracting these um, new uh, would-be members, um, aspiring members, it is more difficult to start with uh, in, a, in, in the current phase of sluggish economic recovery, both in the EU and in the region, in the Western Balkans, to introduce the kind of changes that quite often require uh, fi uh, financing in terms of uh, introducing... Uh, uh, more, more up-to-date, more modern, more um, appropriate form, forms of government institutions, modernizing them, improving pay for police and other law in, uh, enforcement agencies, and of course, uh, a very simple task like mm -hmm. raising uh, the salaries of the judiciary or prosecution organs in order to try to avoid or at least reduce corruption. Um, I, we may want to come back to that issue later on, but as, as I'm fully aware that I'm, I'm sort of... <laughs> Uh, somewhat uh, abusing the time uh, frame al allocated to me. So uh, I think that that issue is, is very important, that we have a, uh, 
in the aftermath of the downturn, it is more difficult to, to be able to pay for, at, at the time of fiscal consolidation across the region, IMF presence in Bosnia, in Serbia, and more recently now in a precautionary arrangement, uh, also in Macedonia, this, this makes this issue more difficult. The, the, the final part of my presentation was going to be looking at some of the what can and ought to be done in order to restore the, the EU's um, transformative power in the region. I suggest that I may be able take to develop... Four, take three or four minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, fine. Oh, yeah. I was going to... Yeah. <laughs> oh, fine. Okay. Um, well, the, the first minute of the two or three minutes would be to say, well... You could argue, and uh, Eurosceptics would say, well, no, there's nothing wrong here. If, 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 these, if, if, if things are slowing down, that's, that's not a bad thing. We burnt our fingers, as they might say in the case of Bulgaria and Romania. Um, let's, uh, let's have a pause, perhaps. Um, let's put our own house in order first. And uh, some of these arguments are uh, certainly valid and worth considering. I think the counter-argument might be, first of all, is that even on, an, on the assumption of a, of a steady progress towards EU integration, as I mentioned earlier, I think a realistic date for uh, enlargement would be around, or accession, would be around 2020, not much before that. If there were to be a pause now, and how, and declared or undeclared, and a declared pause would have, I think, very negative ramifications, I think, even further discouraging uh, reforms. Anyway, even if we were to have a, a, a pause now, I think it would, it, would be, uh, it would lead to further very lengthy delays, and in a sense, the more distant the goal of membership, again, the, the, more, the weaker, I think, the EU's power or impact can become to, to bring about the kind of transformation that is so essential to these countries, whether or not they want to or join the EU, but in terms of introducing, um, introducing um, less corrupt, uh, more modern, more efficient, and more effective forms of governance. Um, having said that, there is another issue. I mean, the cost of the delay, uh, the cost of delay particularly um, if, if this integration process were to grind to a halt, even for a matter of months or a year or two, I think there would be many opportunities for the countries of the region, or the Western world, because that they would be missing out on in terms of this institutional development, of state building, taking advantage even of employment opportunities in the old EU members. Secondly, I think, and looking at it now from the EU's perspective, I think the adverse impact would also affect the existing EU members and the EU itself. Um, that the EU should remain a, a kind of dynamic, a vibrant um, association of states uh, uh, depends at least partially on its ability to expand, I think. Obviously, it also depends on its success in coping with its own problems. But I think this element that there is, it remains attractive, that it can bring in new members, and not just bring them in, and, and in the process improve their, their institutional arrangements, but also uh, that it should be able to integrate them at a higher level of economic, social, and democratic development, democratic political development, than they have at the moment. I think these are all very important parts of the EU's mission and of its vision for its future. And then again, to go slow on that or to bring it to a halt would, I think, impact adversely on the EU itself. Also, I think, important to mention um, that the, uh, in terms of the, uh, the importance of labor shortages that are likely to emerge in many of the um, more prosperous EU countries, particularly once economic uh, growth resumes at perhaps trend rates or pre-crisis rates or something closer to pre-crisis rates, or indeed even without any major um, improvement in the economic outlook, just in terms of the way in which aging societies need young, a younger workforce, uh, the, the, the workforce to be replenished. And here is, I think, a region from where there would be skilled, uh, able, um, willing, young, younger workers to come and, and to countries such as Ireland, but and Britain and, and, and others. So I think that in terms of that too, I think uh, the EU needs to expand. But also I think that um, uh, the whole idea of leaving the South, South, Southeast European, South, Southeast periphery kind of uh, prey to um, the influence of potentially other countries or powers, again, I mentioned Russia as, 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 a, as a possible candidate for that, 
to, to, to increase its sphere of influence, but also, I think, perhaps more realistically and more immediately, to, to leave it to networks of organized crime, those involved in smuggling people, drugs, weapons, uh, at a time when the, the, this task of combating um, organized crime is certainly unfinished, I think this would uh, impact very badly on the EU itself. So I think that given these unpalatable alternatives, I think it would surely, I think, um, benefit the EU to remain engaged in the, in, in the region, to build on these very recent successes, and to try in some ways to neutralize the, uh, the, um, the, 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 the problems and difficulties of recent years, to pursue an enlargement agenda uh, that is realistic, to do it by uh, playing a stronger role behind the scenes, whether in the case of any possible recurrence of the problems, e even in the case of Croatia leading up its membership in relation to Slovenia, which we may want to discuss later, or indeed in helping Montenegro begin accession talks as soon as possible, but even and this may be controversial, I think it's worth exploring, and it's, it's, it's been suggested by some uh, proponents of enlargement, it may even be worth looking at ways in which countries that may seem undeserving of candidate status, uh, certainly are uh, on, on, on current form, Albania and Bosnia, whether it is worth giving them this as the next carrot, or next prize, as it were, on the very strict understanding, and of course, any... Uh, progress with the accession towards accession would of course depend on them meeting the requirements as and when the chapters are opened and, and, and for discussion and so on. So some way I think is, is required in which some kind of price could be given in, um, in the near to me, in the short to medium term and not putting off um, not putting off um, at the, at the sort of this, this uh, offer of a carrot too far and too long. I know this is a uh, this, this will be probably a controversial issue and debatable one, but maybe worth exploring. And I uh, would very much welcome your questions, comments, criticisms in the next uh, half an hour or so.